So if we stop now, I could tell my mom they clapped. <laughs> it's good. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Andre, thank you so much for being here. It's a great pleasure to have you. Uh, no, you know, no introduction needed, but I should say Andre is one of very few players that have achieved to win all four Grand Slams and also um, Olympic Games. So truly amazing, <laughs> amazing career. Number one in the world and number two in my own home. Figure that one. <laughs> Hard to pull off. That's also very amazing, yeah. But maybe I'll start with just a question on tennis. Um, so obviously you and Pete dominated tennis for you know, 15 or so years in the 90s and early 2000s. And then you had uh, suddenly you know, a group of three, uh, three other amazing guys, Roger, Rafa, and, and, and Djokovic, coming to the scene and breaking a lot of records and dominating tennis for the last 15 or so years. How do you see the next generation and who is going to be the next breakout players that are going to, le to lead tennis in the next 10 to 15 years? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of speculation in, in that, quite frankly. But yeah, you, the game has changed so dramatically over the years. You know, I mean, rivalries aren't guaranteed in sports, right? I mean, you need a lot of things to come together. You need two personalities, two people coming from two different perspectives in life, two different styles of play. You know, I'm fighting for number one in the world. And Pete and I had that. Roger Raff obviously have it now with the third. But if you, if you just respect for one second the generation that we're actually watching right now, and you know, in some cases it might be over soon, but um, it took 50 years to have five guys you know, win all four Grand Slams. You know, there was five. And, and one generation of tennis at the same moment in time, three guys do it inside of a couple years. You know. That, that's just simply remarkable. And, and the game has, has moved from a game where um, it used to be when I came onto the scene and through most of my career that I would hit the ball big, and then if somebody had to hit it back with the same amount of intensity, they're taking a risk because that ball would get away. Now with the technology, you know, the strings and the spins, you're actually rewarded uh, by swinging bigger with, with that consistency. So now you got all these spins with full aggression, you know, uh, it's why you don't see people come in the net anymore because you come in, the ball gets down quick, you have to close faster, the ball goes up and it comes down. I mean, Nadal hits balls that, that aren't in until they bounce, right? So, so whenever you change that, you change rules of engagement. You know, yeah. um, My game wouldn't apply anymore just taking somebody's time away because you step inside the court and they can just go like around you. I mean, it's a whole different animal. So, so to, to sort of predict where the game goes, I just, I kind of have to get pretty basic about it and say like in all sports, the next thing to change is just the athlete's going to get bigger and faster and stronger. I mean, um, when you look at um, the best in the world now versus when I played, they're bigger, faster, you know, not necessarily stronger, but they have more options, you know, on, on, on the tennis court. So um, I, I predict the next version is going to be somebody bigger, faster, and stronger. I mean, talent-wise, you look at a Nick Kyrgios and you can't, uh, you, could, you could arguably say there's more talent there than in Federer. I know that's a big statement because of what Federer's accomplished, but what he really does on a court and controlling pace and controlling, he can just take the racket out of somebody's hand, you know, and, uh, but there's a lot that goes in it upstairs too. So what somebody's, how somebody handles that kind of talent is, is between the ears and um, there's no predicting that. Yeah. No, it's certainly very interesting right now what's going to happen, you know, as these guys obviously become older and older and amazingly they still win, but uh, uh, so you went in your career uh, through kind of a, um, you know, up and down and you had a first very big impact on tennis through the, the style and the way you dressed and, and really made it very popular. Uh, but then also you had a phase where, you, you know, it wasn't going as well and that was really a key moment for you to also uh, kind of have a, I, I would assume a transformation or, or find the reason for things that you're also doing today with education. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that time uh, when, you know, things weren't going as well on the tennis court, but how you found that way back and, and uh, you know, proved many people wrong that didn't believe that you can make it back even stronger? Sure, sure. So, I mean, we're all here because we care about education from one vantage point or, or another, and, and, you know, I'm, I'm here um, for the same reason. You know, uh, um, my journey was an interesting one um, that, uh, that 
in the fact that I didn't have a choice in my life. Um, and we know, all know in this room that with education, there's hope. With education, there's, there's choice. With education, there's a future. And, and my sort of uh, um, demon, if you will, was I never liked tennis. I actually hated it for, for the majority of my life and career. And my father, for us, it was funny, funny to you now, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> wasn't funny for 25 years, I assure you. Um, but my father, you know, forced me to play, and, and there was there's a real resentment I had to what tennis meant in our home, right? I mean, I saw my siblings, their relationship with my dad, and I saw the importance of it, and never understood the the reason for that importance, and resented what it did to us as internally as a family. I got sent away from home at 13 to a boot camp, tennis boot camp in Florida, you know, where there's no adult supervision where um, you know, you're being raised by other teenagers, other teenagers. It was like you know, Lord of the Flies with forehands and backhands. And, and, and I resented being there, and I went through a rebellious phase, and the only way out was to succeed. So, so I did. Fear is one hell of a motivator. And I turned pro, and I got out there. And now I'm on the world stage being told who I was. You know, and I didn't even know who I was. And quite frankly, hated what I did and hated people asking me. And all of it was a difficult journey, but I was always raised to believe that I was supposed to be number one in the world and that somehow this was going to you know, change something. And, and so my, my goal was just to win. I thought there was an answer in that. And, and, I, and I did, and I won, and I was miserable, and I won, and I was disconnected with my, with my life. I always felt like I was pretending. And then I said, well, I've got to get the number one in the world. I get the number one in the world. And I was let in on a dirty little secret that being number one in the world doesn't change anything. And, uh, that's when I started a pretty significant downward spiral in, in my life with a lot of choices that uh, you know we don't need to spend too much time on, but a lot of self-destructive choices. And you know I fell from number one in the world to 140 in the world, and I was the only one saw it, that saw it coming, um, and I was the only one that knew why it was happening. You know, and uh, and I remember at my lowest point, 140, I, I took a wild card into the tournament in Stuttgart, Germany. And for those of you that don't know what a wild card is, it's it's when you're not ranked high enough to get in, so they have to, you know, give you an entry, and because you can still sell seats. And so I play this tournament. I rightfully get what I deserve. I lose, you know, first round pretty quickly. And my coach takes me to the room and shuts the door behind us and says that we're going to quit or we're going to start over. And I remember thinking to myself at that moment, I've never hated tennis so much in my life. You know, uh, really, that moment was probably the worst. And and as I was going through this contemplation of giving myself permission to to, to quit. You know, I was looking at all these people outside and these cars and traffic in Stuttgart, Germany, and I, and I, and I, and I started to ask, well, what do these people do, and do they really, you know, love what they do, and if they do, how, why, did they choose what they do? And it, it started to occur to me in, in a real an epiphany kind of way um, that that um, y y nobody really chooses their their life. I mean, we can think we do, but we don't, right? I mean, we can't choose where we're born. You can't choose what your strengths and weaknesses are, or how we're nurtured, any of that. Um, but it doesn't mean you can't have reason. It doesn't mean you can't take ownership of your life. And so this thought, um, I feel like I'm in a Vegas nightclub, for God's sake. <laughs> what the hell's going on? Oh, that's much better. <laughs> you know, but the fact that you can take ownership of your life really was an epiphany. But the truth is, epiphanies don't change your life. It's what you do with them. And so I left that, I left that room saying to myself that I'm going to start over, but I'm going to start with finding my reason. And um, I didn't know what that meant. I went home, and I saw a show in 60 Minutes uh, about Kip, uh, uh, charter school operator, um, uh, Michael Feinberg, Dave Levin, uh, Knowledge is Power program is, is what it stands for, for those of you that don't know. But I'm watching him, them rolling up their sleeves and changing these children's lives in this charter school. I'm watching these children that have no choice in their life, that truly have no choice. Here I am, you know, bitching about being number one in the world, and here these kids are, and they can't break the downward spiral of their own, of their own environment. And I'm watching these guys give them the tools, and, and, and I just connected so much with those kids through that TV screen that what seemed to be overnight, um, I took out a $40 million mortgage, Got my charter, uh, got my charter, and decided to build uh, um, my own charter school in the most economically challenged area of Las Vegas. It was uh, we're the fifth largest school district in America. 
Um, we're 50th in kids we put in the college, and you know, my hope and dream was not just to affect those kids, was, but was to prove that um, we fail them, they don't fail us. And um, you know, I had to learn the hard way. I'm an eighth grade dropout. I'm not an educator, I'm not an operator. Um, but I was able to outraise a lot of a lot of a lot of uh, mistakes, um, and I can assure you that um, there is no sleeping pill on the face of this earth that can accommodate for a forty million dollar mortgage. It is. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I had to get back out there on the court, and I had to I had to do it right again, and I had to win again, but this time for an entirely different reason. You know, I was I was fighting on behalf of something that meant. Uh, that was bigger than me, uh, but yet that I was very, you know, connected to. And, and that reason gave me purpose every day. So the journey back is, is a long one, and I, I know there's a relative amount of time here, so I'm not going to, um, there's a lot to share in what that process is like. But, but the bottom line is, is I had to do it. I had to do it again, doing it for a different way. I never felt so connected to something that I hated so much um, for, for so long. So it, education really saved me in, in a lot of ways. And, and what I've given it pales in comparison to, to what, it's, what it's given me. Um, but in that, in that journey, though, of building my own charter school, um, I did have to recognize that I'm an eighth grade dropout. I did have to recognize that I'm not an operator, that I'm not an educator. Um, but I don't know nature, nurture, if I was born this way or if tennis really gave me this tool. But I always, you, I'm always problem solving. You know, you, in tennis, it's what you have to do. It's you got, you don't have to be good. Just be better than one person. Figure it out, right? And and that's what that's what tennis is in a nutshell. But so I'm sitting here and I'm I'm looking at 1,200 kids in my school um, with 100% graduation rate um, uh, compared to the lowest in the country, which is you know next door to us, basically down the street uh, to our district peers. And I'm and I'm going. I have 3,000 on the waiting list. So here's the world that I come from, and I could probably thank my dad for this perspective, which is I'm twice the failure I am than success. You know, uh, 3,000 kids want in, and only 1,200 kids are here. So the problem that I really wanted to address is 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 sustainable scalability, right? Because we have to shorten these lines. This is not the only district in the country. This is not the only you know, uh, place that has, that has these, 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 these issues. So um, in looking at it, I was able to look at it not as an educator, as an operator. And I started to look at it, uh, you know, via the charter model, which uh, I'm going to assume everybody knows wh how that model works, where the state allocation follows a child to your school, that it, it's, not, it's, not a, it's not a teacher issue. You know, every, nobody, nobody becomes a teacher for fame or fortune. You know, they do it because they want a learning friendly environment to impact the lives of, 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 of kids. And if you, you need to provide that, it's not, it's not the demand, it's not the need. We, we have the children that, 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 that are asking for a quality educational seat. You know, we have, we, it's not the problem with the scalability of a, of a best in class charter school operator is actually the facility itself, right? Because you can't access public dollars to build your facility. But once you have your charter, and you incubate, you know, and the money follows the kids to your school, then eventually, you know, you have uh, potentially a sustainable uh, way of growing. So the question then becomes, if I'm not an operator, I'm not an educator, but I've been a, a facilitator to facilitate this, maybe there's a way I can use those tools to facilitate an expansion and growth for others. And, and, and I realize it's, this is really an infrastructure issue. So, I went down, scoured the country, went down, met with a gentleman who's um, very experienced in, in inner city investing. Um, and we locked ourselves in a room as we shared our passion and frustration for, for education. And we put together um, a business model um, because both of us were sick and tired of waiting for the government to solve our problems. And we both recognize, being philanthropists in our, in our own respective ways, that philanthropy ends when philanthropists run out of money or when philanthropists change their, their, where they direct those money. So, but we can still innovate in this country. So what if we went to the private sector? And what if we sold a business model that sort of said, give us your money. Don't give it. I mean, invest it. We go build a school for a great operator. 
On day one, there's a demand. The school is filled. X amount of kids go there. The money follows the kids. There's revenue stream from day one. Instead of being a landlord in these um, great operators' lives, we let them stabilize over a three-year period and through the taxes and bond market, refinance them out uh, for a purchase price that, that buys back the school, gives them equity in it, drops their, 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 their cost of, 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 of facility, and satisfies a like-minded investor, an investor that says, I don't want to give away my money, I don't need huge returns, but I also want to see huge societal change, right? And so we put this group of investors together, uh, went out and deployed in, you know, those, those, you know, cut to the end in the last, so it took me 15 years for one charter school for 1,200 kids, um, and in the last five and a half years deployed over um, about a billion dollars across the country and built 94 schools for best-in-class operators. And, um, You know, so to say that education has changed my life is an understatement because it's become, it's become my life. It was gave me my reason for the second part of my career, gave me my my wife. I would never would have met her had I quit that day. Um, my my children, my my future, the reason why I get up in the morning. Um, so we all we all share that um, in common. But more important than than that is is what everybody here is doing, which is trying to find innovative new ways to address real issues that exist that can only be solved um, you know, if we have these opportunities. So you know, it's, I'm gonna give my applause, to, my, my applause to all of you for taking time out of your lives to be here for uh, you know, the, same, the same objectives. It's uh, truly remarkable what, what you've been doing and also you're setting a great example. It seems like Roger Feather has his own um, foundation that focuses on kids' education in South Africa. No, Similarly. he just makes that up. He doesn't do it. <laughs> but my guess is he came to you for advice. Everybody that has a phone, I'm just kidding. <laughs> and then uh, Djokovic has his own in Serbia, so it seems oh, like cool. you are setting an example for many of the others that uh, kind of follow you. But um, so you're also involved with a kindergarten-focused uh, startup uh, that is here, Square, Par Square Panda. And um, what was the reason you wanted to join that, and, and how do you see that? Uh, well, well, again, my, my journey doesn't stop, right? So you build 94 schools. We still have, you know, uh, we'll build 100 more in the next, you know, five, six years. Um, but you, and again, uh, charter schools aren't a panacea for education, as we all know. I mean. 85% of charter schools don't outperform their district peers. So I'm not a fan of scaling mediocrity. Let's just be clear about that. But the top 15%, they by far and away overachieve their district peers. And those are the partners we have that we're scaling. So as we build, we'll be building more schools. But what I've seen is you know, my school was stolen best practices. It's what I did. I just, if it works somewhere, I just took it, right? And, if somebody wants to know what we're doing that's working, I just give it away. And, and so I'm, I'm, I'm seeing these operators. I'm learning their business and how they affect these children's lives and the way that they do, because everybody has this different in row. And they all have a very similar issue. And it all starts at the earliest of ages. And I'm listening to them tell me where they focus, how they focus, what they need to figure out, what they're trying to solve for. And it boils down to the earliest of ages for childhood literacy, right? Because you spend the first part of your life learning to read, and then you spend the rest of your life reading to learn. And the trajectory of that, of that at the age of you know, third grade, fourth grade, is a child who's trying to read and, an, and another child who's processing what they're reading. And so the hope and the trajectory of their future is really dependent on early childhood literacy, and it's dependent on, in some cases, even in this country, as we know, secondhand English language learning. A lot of these kids don't go home to a house that speaks English. So what do you do with this? And this is where um, a gentleman by the name of Andy Butler is here somewhere, over there, with the, the white, did I say white hair? The, uh, gray hair. He, uh, uh, he's, he, he, he called, he, 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 he Sometimes it's better not to have options. That's all right. Um, he, he, cold called, he cold called me because he knew what I was doing in, in the 
the, the space in between philanthropy and, and government and for-profit, and he knows I know this journey pretty well through, through what I'm doing, and you know, I, he, he refers to it as a warm call. It was a cold call. And he, he, he pitched me on, on what he thinks he has that, that can impact these children um, in the very heart of this issue. And it's, it's a platform, it's called Square Panda. Um, you know, a lot of our studies come from Stanford, UCSF, many, many high-end, um, you know, uh, the neuroscience part of how everybody's brain works differently. And we weren't evolved as a society to read. We, we just weren't. So understanding how the brain works is not really the difficult part for those that know it. The difficult part is how do you disperse this to the the world at large and give everybody the tools to understand everybody's personal ability to, to learn how to read and what their roadmap looks like. So our platform allows for that personalized data feedback um, with, with the highest degree of neuroscience that we've come to know to teach a child to read um, at, at, at a much more expensive rate through a game-based activity that is um, self-intuitive, self, self, you know, leads the child. The parent doesn't need to be, you know, this is meant for, for schools, it's meant for homes, it's meant for um, other countries, it's meant for language learning, it's meant for, it has so many implications, dyslexia, red flagging dyslexia implications, autism implications. So I took this and I said, give me three months. And I went and I put it in my schools just, just as a case study. I just want to see what it does, and the difference in the children that read at the lowest level was absolutely remarkable. So when I saw that it actually does this, um, because I'm not a smart guy, I tried to understand the, the neuroscience side of it, and I'm doing my best to continue to understand it, um, but when I saw what it does, I was compelled not to put my name to something, right? That's that's, I was compelled to invest in it. I was compelled to help Andy build it. I was compelled to put my brand behind it. I was compelled to travel the world and make this a, a, a reality in the lives of millions of people. And you know, where we are today is pretty, pretty darn exciting. I mean, you know, big office in Silicon, we have office in, Beijing um, and also in Mumbai. It's, uh, but it's talk about a scalable way. It makes what I'm doing with the charter school seem like it's actually not a scalable approach. I mean, we were talking about being able to impact somebody specifically to their strengths and weaknesses in real time and help them take the next step in their journey around either learning English or, or, or reading. So. Uh, very exciting. I mean, I, I'm, uh, I'm thrilled, and I, I don't know where this journey is going to ultimately take us, but I know we have, a, we have a hell of a plan. Yeah, and certainly early childhood education is so important, as uh, that is the time that really, um, you know, the brain develops the most and, and kids are able to learn the most. Oh, it's the biggest return on investment, the earlier, yeah. the earlier that you, you invest in a child's life. I mean, it's, uh, we can... We can invest in, in children or we can build prisons. It's our, it's our choice. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So maybe to finish off, what are you more, most excited about in the next five years in, in terms of what you're focused on? Um, our two kids leaving the house. <laughs> our two strangers. No. Well, one of them is becoming a pretty good uh, baseball player, right? Um, yeah, his mom thinks so for sure. But I, you know, it, it, it's not you don't eat what you kill in baseball. So you need a lot of people to believe in, in your abilities. But he's thri he's thriving and he loves it. Uh, no, but my, you know, I I go vertical before I go horizontal. Like I, I dig deep into something. So you know, I'm not I, I will not fail this company. Square Panda will become a, 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 ideally, a household name. I mean, where people are using it, and it's growing in its, in its, in its intellectual property, and it's delivering better and better results. Um, and so once I'm secure in that, um, I got to figure something out. 
Great. Well, Andre, it was a pleasure to have you here. So thank you very much for coming and sharing all, all your insights. Thank you. Andre, I everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.